Roads are clear because county workers have been out all day long spreading rock salt, while city crews have also been out in rock salt trucks, but they've also been using another weapon to fight the freeze that they've only had about a week. Now you're looking at a live shot of the roof that is holding the church steeple up. Crews just started spraying water on it again about 30 seconds ago. They say that that roof is made of heavy timber, wood the size of large logs, and they say if one of those logs burns through, that steeple will probably topple over. Now the church has not announced its plans for Sunday services yet. This was the largest debate that all four of these candidates have taken part in so far during this campaign season. Robin and John, trial proceedings are still going on inside the federal courthouse at this hour. Most of the day has been filled with testimony from some of the prosecution's witnesses. The decorations are set up, the campaign posters are up on the wall, and the stage is set for the band to begin later tonight. All that's needed now are people to fill this ballroom. We're about 300 miles from Knoxville. Early this morning, court started with a pool of 500 jurors by 3 o'clock central time this afternoon. That number was cut down. Travelers should not try to go anywhere too merrily tonight. I'm actually on Liberty Street overpass above Interstate 40. 10 News investigative reporter Hillary Lake has been following this trial for us. She joins us live from downtown Knoxville with the latest on tonight's verdict. Hillary. Well, Robin and John, here's the tally on those uh, charges against Vanessa Coleman. 13 guilty counts, four not guilty. One of the guilty counts, including facilitation of first degree murder of Shannon Christian. They're going to start by milling or grinding the asphalt off the driving surface. And that's the first step towards dismantling the bridge down to its arches. Well, they've suppressed a lot of those flames down. And I'm actually standing here with DJ Corcoran of Knoxville Fire. DJ, what can you tell us at this time? Uh, the fire came in. Good evening. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Hillary Lake. 20-year-old Isaac Grubb of Lenore City fell 45 feet to his death Friday night. Of course, most folks will bring their smartphones along for the drive to their Labor Day destination. And just like having a designated driver if you're drinking, many are now saying social drivers need to get a designated texter. I'm Hillary Lake. If Big Orange fans needed another reason to get excited for next week's game against the Gators, well, they got two today. We'll let the cleanup begin. More than 102 thousand people spent Saturday at Neyland Stadium to watch the Vols take on Florida and that adds up to a lot of trash. In here is the landing pad for the balloon that this will be the base where it's tethered down. It's an attraction that's been two years and two million dollars in the making. And it's all with helium instead of the propane with the hot air balloons. A helium filled balloon like this one called the wonders of flight is set to soar above Robin Turner's Wonderworks property in Pigeon Forge. Everything's on target. The pilots have been hired. The pilots have been trained. But an essential part of the ride is missing. That's keeping it grounded. There's a, a worldwide helium shortage, and there is no helium. That's right. Helium is in short supply. I've been worried about that for some time because of various decisions that were made in the 1990s about how to manage the United States stockpile of helium. Kevin Jones works with helium every day in his job as a scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Both liquid and gas forms of the element are critical ingredients of energy research. Recently, the lab was notified by its helium supplier that its purchase amount is cut by nearly half. Over the past few months, we've had to make deals between our, uh, between our various research programs in the laboratory to help each other out uh, in to have enough helium available to do some of the experiments we want to do. The shortage also affects medical science. Consider this, MRI machines won't work without helium. UT Medical Center lost all of the liquid helium from one of its machines last year. Uh, I believe it took us about a week and a half to get the 200 liters necessary to fill that system back up and get operational again. The delay meant some patients had to wait for imaging. The number of party balloons taking shape at all occasions party rentals in Knoxville is also slow. If they just wanted a small tank that would blow up maybe 100 balloons, it was about uh, $55. Today, I think we rent that same tank for about $150. So what's drawing down the helium supply and driving up the price? The U.S. holds 34% of helium reserves in the world. A 1996 bill meant to reduce spending requires the U.S. to sell off its helium reserves by 2015. The government initially purchased the stockpile from private companies during the 1960s for military purposes.
It is made by radioactive decay of heavy elements like uranium underground. Um, so it's being made very slowly, much slower than uh, we are using it. Now, researchers fear there eventually won't be enough helium to go around to places like UT Medical Center, ORNL, your birthday balloon, and to lift the wonders of flight off the ground. We'll have to keep the pilots on, on standby to get through this. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it affects the economy. When the supply is corrected, uh, you know, we'll be in line and ready to go. 10 News investigative reporter Hillary Lake has been working on this story for months now. And Hillary joins us with the latest. A former Monroe County inmate says his time behind bars left him blind. And now taxpayers are footing his medical bills. I'm grateful for my parents to take care of me. A parent's unconditional love. No one else would have. That's what's kept Stephen Reed steady on the roughest road of his life. It's awful. Obviously, I'm blind, but I can't smell or I can't taste. I don't hear that good. Not where I thought I'd be at 28 years old. 10 News visited Stephen last month, hundreds of miles from his East Tennessee home in Detroit, Michigan. That's where his mother, Deborah Miller, has helped him deal with his disabilities. Cooking, cleaning, you know, help him find stuff, uh, get his clothes out for him. I can't take care of my kids. I don't, that's what hurts me the most, you know, my kids. But this father of five was not born into a pitch black world. It just got dark. Stephen contracted a rare aggressive infection. Most people that have cryptococcal meningitis will have a headache and that headache will be one that just stays there every day for days and days. Uh, most people will have symptoms for two weeks or more uh, before it finally gets severe enough that somebody will pick it up. Stephen's medical records show he was healthy when his symptoms initially appeared in February of 2012. Severe headaches and I was double vision, blurred vision. I complained for right at a month. At the time, Stephen was an inmate at the Monroe County Jail in Madisonville. I took a lot of stuff for granted. If I had to do it over again, I wouldn't. He'd been locked up since November 2011 for violating probation from a prior drug conviction. I know I contracted it there. That place is, it's like a dungeon. Jail records show Stephen asked for medical attention on February 16th for, quote, bad headaches making me sick. He did not see a nurse employed by the jail's contractor, Quality Correctional Health Care, until two days later. The nurse prescribed Stephen ibuprofen and sent him back to his cell. All you had to do was look at me and tell that I was severely sick. Stephen's jail records show he saw jail nurses four more times over the next five days with the same symptoms. On the morning of February 24th, Stephen's chart reveals officers told the nurse he had been, quote, lying on the ground, arching his back. His eyes were rolling back. They told the nurse it appeared he was having a seizure. The nurse wrote on Stephen's chart that he could not give a urine sample. Quote, inmate placed in observation cell on a mat on the floor. Will continue to monitor an attempt to obtain urine specimen. My eyes were so swelled out of my head, I couldn't hardly shut my eyelids. You know something's wrong with somebody when they're like that. When people start to develop red flag signs, as I would call them, those are the kind of headache symptoms that should be evaluated on a very urgent basis. Stephen's medical records show he did not see a doctor until the night of the 24th when deputies took him to the Sweetwater Hospital ER for a CAT scan. There, a doctor diagnosed Stephen with sinusitis, prescribed amoxicillin, and sent him back to the jail. Two days later, deputies took Stephen for outside medical care once again. Records show he was already blind when doctors admitted him to Park West Medical Center in Knoxville in the early morning hours of the 27th. There, a doctor eventually diagnosed Stephen with cryptococcal meningitis. It was terrible, and, you know, for almost two and a half weeks, we didn't know if he was going to live. You know, my child was going to die. The disease did not take Stephen's life, but it did take his sight. Dr. Rasnick says it's hard to determine when or where a person gets infected. Still, Stephen believes his disabilities are the result of not getting adequate medical treatment at the jail. Something needs to be done about so this don't happen to anybody else. Alex Friedman is associate director for the Human Rights Defense Center based in Nashville. 
He spent a decade in Tennessee facilities for crimes like armed robbery. Today, he's an inmate advocate pushing for reform. The for-profit nature of uh, our medical care system in prisons and jails means that medical decisions are not always being made based on what a doctor you know, thinks is, is needed or required. Although Monroe County authorities released Stephen shortly after his diagnosis, while in custody, Stephen's medical expenses for outside health care add up to nearly $300,000. That does not include charges from the jail's health care provider. And Tennessee taxpayers will foot those bills. Friedman says no one tracks cases of alleged inadequate medical care in jails, but stories like Stevens are more common than not. 10 News asked Monroe County Sheriff Bill Bivens for a tour of the inside of the jail. He denied our request. We were able to obtain the jail's state inspection records from the Tennessee Corrections Institute. For the past five years, the facility failed its initial surprise inspections because of overcrowding and cleanliness issues. It passed an announced second inspection each time. Today, Stephen's headaches are gone, and he's learning how to live with less independence. I'm pretty much in a lifetime sentence now. I was due to get out in six weeks. After spending two months in the hospital and another six with his family in Detroit, Ready to watch your fingers now. Stephen returned home to East Tennessee a few weeks ago. He's adjusting to life as a husband and as a father with disabilities. My wife, family, they're real good with me and stuff. And I got a bunch of people that love me around here. And just to be with my kids is, is better than being alone. Stephen says his hope for healing and the hearts of his family keep him strong. Stephen remains on hardcore antibiotics. He also says he plans to take legal action against the Monroe County Sheriff's Department and its health care provider, another cost that could end up on the backs of taxpayers. Again, there is no easy way to track cases like this through a state system. And one other note, we reached out to the Monroe County Sheriff's Department and to its health care provider to take part in this story. Both declined.